You have questions? The Bible has answers. This program, overseen by the Philip Street Church of Christ, is dedicated to answering your questions with God's Word. Please join us for the period of study as we seek to give a Bible answer. And now, here is your moderator. Hello everyone, from wherever you're watching, this is the Bible Answer. I'm Mike McDaniel. I serve as the moderator of the program. I'm the preacher of the Central Church of Christ in Crothersville, Missouri. This program is overseen by the good elders of the Phillips Street Church of Christ in Dyersburg, Tennessee, and financially supported by 47 churches of Christ throughout a six-state area, and we're grateful to them. And at the end of our program, you'll see their names listed. We encourage you to work and worship with them whenever you might have the possibility of doing so. Now we have three gospel preachers with us to serve as panelists. We'll have them introduce themselves to you once again. Hello, I'm Bill Brandstetter. I serve as the preacher of the Marian Church of Christ in Marion, Illinois. Hi, I'm Daryl Simon. I preach for the Church of Christ in Harrisburg, Illinois. I'm Gerald Cowan and I preach currently for the DuCoin Church of Christ in DuCoin, Illinois, and I'd like to add, if I may, that for about 23 years I've been an off-and-on short-term missionary to a place called Albania, and I wish you would keep Albania and every other country in the world in your prayers and in your thoughts and efforts and maybe in your support in the cause of Christ. Thank you. So glad to have these brethren with us today, and now to Brother Simon. For his first question today on a Bible answer, it is this, and it's a good one. How can I overcome ministry burnout? Brother Simon. Well, I would say first, yes. <laughs> ministry burnout is a possibility. And I might say, preacher, admit it. <laughs> because we've, we've all been there, and we have at times suffered from ministry burnout, but our question concerns overcoming that. I was thinking I should have just done some phone interviews with preachers who have been preaching for 50 or 60 years and asked them how they've been able to overcome ministry burnout. Here's this reminder to preachers from 2 Timothy chapter 4 from the Apostle Paul. I charge thee in the sight of God and of Christ Jesus, who shall judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heap to themselves teachers after their own lust and will turn away their ears from the truth and turn aside unto fables. But be thou sober in all things, suffer hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill thy ministry, for I am already being offered and the time of my departure is come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith. I think there are several things that we can remember as preachers in trying to overcome ministry burnout. One of the things that encourages me in trying to overcome ministry burnout is to remember whom I am serving. I think of Paul in his ministry. And Paul, uh, as, as a great apostle, continually remembered that he was serving the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, there are some verses that uh, we ought to consider. What then is Apollos? And what is Paul, ministers through whom ye believed, and each as the Lord gave to him? I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, but each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. Ye are God's husbandry, God's building. So I would encourage us, if we're facing ministry burnout, to remember that we're serving the Lord God. This is his business, and we are his servants. 
I might also say that if needed, before quitting, take a sabbatical. Just ask for one. Ask your elders, your congregation, saying, listen, I'm, really, I'm getting tired, and I just need a sabbatical for just some time. I don't want to quit preaching. I just need some time away uh, to be able to rest and relax. What if we just followed Jesus' example? You know, there were times Jesus was overwhelmed by the crowds. Sometimes Jesus called the multitudes to him. Other times Jesus sent the multitudes away. And he would often go to deserted places, spending time in prayer to God, no doubt asking God for strength in the ministry that he was engaged in. That, listen, things are getting pretty heavy. And I just need a little time to rest. How about if we just get out of ourselves and remember others? Isn't it great to be a servant of God? Sometimes we get caught up in ourselves and maybe we forget that we are to be serving other people, having their uh, best interest at heart and in mind. I remember reading some time ago that one preacher who had been preaching for many, many years says in your reading and studying of the Bible, don't just look for something whereby you can preach a sermon to someone else. Think about how you can, uh, in your personal life, apply what God's Word says. Be refreshed by the reading and by the study. Sometimes our demands are so great and we put a lot of demands upon ourselves that maybe we don't need to put upon ourselves. Till I come, give attention to the reading of the word, to exhortation, to doctrine, and we need that. So not just uh, preparing sermons from our reading and study and devotional life, but taking uh, those things on ourselves. Go on mission trips, uh, set up Bible studies, uh, spend time with helping people, uh, uh, find individuals that uh, you can uh, teach others the Word of God to. Go to workshops, go to seminars, audit Bible classes. There are just uh, many things that, that we can do. Be with other preachers who can encourage. You know, Timothy had a Paul. <laughs> wouldn't, it be, wouldn't it be great to be a Paul to a Timothy? To be able to mentor and help and encourage and work with? Again, it's just uh, trying to think of things that we can do. Pray diligently and continually to God for strength. Again, there are just many, many ways that we can be involved in uh, overcoming uh, ministry burnout, burnout. Another thing I would say is to delegate in the work. Sometimes we take on so much, and instead of delegating, we say, well, it seems like if it's going to get done, I've got to do it. But be a better delegator. Delegate in the work. Find those Christians that are willing to serve, that, that in fact would probably be glad <laughs> uh, to ask you to, delegate, to uh, be involved in the work. Cultivate interests that are not uh, related to your ministry. Maybe hobbies that you have, maybe uh, uh, fishing or, or hunting or just uh, doing those things that you like to do and to be able to get away to do those things not related to your ministry. Finally, I would say develop a good sense of humor. <laughs> sometimes that is necessary in our ministries. We often are criticized. Sometimes people become critical of us. They become demanding of us and we demand oftentimes uh, too much from ourselves. Things happen uh, in our ministry and we ought to learn to develop a good sense of humor. Well, I hope these things help. You know, this is the greatest ministry of all. 
What a great work and responsibility we have. Yes, and we take those things seriously. But sometimes we just need to do those things to refresh ourselves. We need to be good soldiers, as Paul encouraged Timothy through the Holy Spirit to be. We want to be faithful to God in all that we do. And so just hang in there. Don't give it up. Don't quit. God will reward you. Thank you for your question. Thank you for that excellent answer to Brother Cowan. Why would an all-knowing God begin the process of creation knowing that it would be corrupted by evil and lead to so much heartache? Brother Cowan. Jesus sometimes, when he was asked difficult questions, would ask a question of his own and say, in effect, if you can't answer my question, I won't answer yours. But sometimes the question that he asked, if they could have answered it, would have answered the question that they asked of him. And I think that's the case now. Why would anybody want to bring children into a world that is corrupt, where they would be exposed to so much danger, so many problems, so much sin and suffering, where they could be tempted and drawn away to destruction? Why would anybody want to bring children into such a world as that? If you can answer that, you can also answer why God created a world that he knew would go astray and people who would go astray. I have children, I have grandchildren, I have great-grandchildren. I'm not too many years away from great-great-grandchildren. And I've never told any of those people not to have children not to bring any more children into the world. I rejoice in, I take great joy and some degree of pride and pleasure in all of those who are descended from me and from my wife. The joy of having them and the joy of knowing that there's a possibility of saving them for eternity, for heaven, even though they are exposed to incredible pressures, social and moral and civic and spiritual in the present world. The risk is worth taking for the joy that is possible. I don't know why we seem to think that we could tell God how to do it better uh, than the way he's done it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul asked the question, who, now let me just paraphrase it, which of you is wise enough to instruct God? Who can instruct God? Nobody can. God himself said through Isaiah, chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, my ways are so high above yours, my thoughts so high above yours, it, it, it's as high as the heavens are above the earth. We cannot begin to comprehend all that was in God's mind and in God's purpose and in God's promise. We can't comprehend it, but we can believe it and act upon it. And I wouldn't suggest to God that he do something other than what he's done or make me something other than what I am. In Romans chapter 9, Paul uh, and, and, and he has in mind, surely, some things said by Jeremiah and Isaiah. Uh, people say, God, why'd you make me this way? Why didn't you make me some other way? And there are people now who are saying, God, why didn't you make me something other? You know, I, I, I wish I were just a dog or, or whatever, because whatever the reason may be that you give, you're not going to improve on God's wisdom, and you're not going to change God's mind. What we need to learn to do is live with the world as it is, help, helpfully, hopefully, uh, make it or help it become what it ought to be. But we have to deal with what's here, with the people who are here, and not say, well, if it were some other way, I would do it some other way. Do it the way you can do it. Do it with what you've got where you are, and do it all the time, but be sure it's the way God wants it done. I've said before on this program, I'll repeat myself here, if you do it God's way, you get God's promise. 
If you change God's way, well, do what you can because that's all you're going to get, what you're able to do for yourself. We don't change God's mind. We don't instruct Him. We listen to Him. We listen to His Spirit. So, a world that has been corrupted, and, and, and I, I, I think I need to add this. Uh, this was implied somewhat in the question, or in questions like this, which are frequently asked. The world was not corrupted by sin. The universe did not become corrupted. Mankind did not become corrupted. You did not corrupt it, uh, are not corrupted by uh, the, what happened in the past. Adam did not corrupt the world. His sin corrupted Adam. And there were consequences in the world and for other people and for him. But it is wrong to say that, uh, that, that sin entered the world and the world became corrupt. God did not fall, God did not fail in his creation. Mankind didn't fall and fail in the sin of one man. Adam failed, now Adam fell. And if you fail to keep God's will, God's commandments that are bound upon you, if you fail, you will fall. Nobody else has to fall with you. And you don't have to fall because others have failed and fallen. Just remember, God has never failed and God has never fallen in anything. God has kept His Word, and He will. He will. That's His promise. I'm glad for the question, questions like this that make us think about our relationship to Him and to what He has done and is doing and will do for us now and forevermore. Thank you again for your question. Thank you. We've reached the halfway point of our program today. We want to offer you a free track. Our track today is the Evidence of Pardon. If you'd like to have this track, or if you'd like to receive our free eight lesson Bible correspondence course, if you, if you take the course, we'll send you the first lesson. If you will study it with your Bible, fill out the question, send it back to us, we'll send you lesson two. If you complete all eight lessons, you will receive a certificate for completing the course. So if you'd like the course or the track or both, or to send us your question, just contact us at Phillips Street Church of Christ, 912 Phillips Street, Dyersburg, Tennessee, 38024. We can be reached by our contact page on our website. That's www.abibleanswertv.org. We can be reached by email. Just email us at abibleanswer at earthlink.net. Or you may call our toll-free number, 1-800-436-0463. Leave your address in a good, clear voice, and we'll seek to meet your request. We're always in need of, a, of good questions and a Bible answer. So if you have a question, please send it to us, and you'll see some more contact information at the end of our program today. Now to Brother Brandstatter. We have this question. Please discuss Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and the theory that angels married women and produced giants as their offspring. Brother Brandstatter. Thank you very much for this good question, and let me emphasize it's a theory that angels produced offspring that were giants. We're going to look at our text in Genesis chapter 6, which is a pivotal chapter in the book of Genesis. If we go back to chapter 4, we know Cain killed Abel, a curse was pronounced upon Cain. And Genesis chapter 4 closes with this statement, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos, then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Uh, then chapter 5 is a genealogy from Adam through Noah. In Genesis chapter 6, we find the statement in verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So Genesis 6 is kind of a pivotal point. We find the word grace mentioned for the first time. We find a flood coming upon all mankind, that their thoughts were evil continually, so God planned on destroying the earth. We read about Noah and the command to build the ark and the promise of the rainbow and all kinds of different things in Genesis chapter 6 that are very, very significant. It's, it's a pivotal point in the book of Genesis. But let's look at our text 
And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, unto the men, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. When I was at the Memphis School of Preaching in 86 to 88, Brother Curtis Cates told us one time about a principle of Bible study called the principle of first mention, where you go back to where something is first mentioned in the Bible and it will give you a great insight as to how it's used elsewhere. I want to take that principle and kind of turn it around. Here you have the term sons of God used for the first time. When we find it elsewhere in Scripture, we find that it always means someone who is in a right relationship with God. For example, in Galatians 3 verse 26, we're all sons of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Galatians 3 27, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ to put on Christ. Then in 1 John 3 1, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So, in our text, in Genesis chapter 6, we have it used for the first time as sons of God. Therefore, it's clear that it's talking about those that were in the right relationship with God, no doubt descendants of Seth. And then in verse 3, the Lord said, this is back in Genesis 6, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he is also flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. Now here's the verse under consideration, verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days, and watch this, and after that the daughters of men, or after that when the sons of God came to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. Notice the giants were already there. Then it says after that the sons of God, the, the, the righteous, the descendants of Seth, came into the daughters of men. And they bore children, the same shall be mighty men, which were of old men of renown. That is, men who had a high stature in their society or in that age. Then verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of men was great in the earth, and that every imagination of his thoughts was evil only continually. The daughters of men no doubt are those who were evil, who did not obey God, who were not righteous, perhaps descendants of Cain. And as a result of this intermarriaging of the righteous, the sons of God, and the daughters of men, evil came upon the earth, and it began to spread. And it repented the Lord that he made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And he said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. So the sons of God no doubt are the righteous, the ones that were descendant of Cain. The daughters of men were evil. And because of that intermingling, problems came upon the earth and created the situation whereby God destroyed the earth with a flood. Thank you very much for this good question. Thank you very much for that good answer. You know, I, I was just thinking about if the sons of God were, were angels, um, how did the flood serve as a judgment on them? Did, that, did angels drown? Well, of course not. Well, of course not. Brother Simon, does a person have to attend church to go to heaven? Brother Simon. Well, I, I understand the question. Uh, there's just something disturbing to me about the word have to. Uh, I grew up with brothers and a sister, and there were some Sunday mornings that one of my brothers would say, well, do we have to go to church today? And... I want to go. <laughs> the church is the body of Christ. The church is the saved of Christ. I need my brothers and I need my sisters. I want to be there to be built up. I want to be among the saved so that I can receive some encouragement from the saved to go to heaven. You know, Acts 2 says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. In Acts 20 and verse 7, we're told they did that on the first day of the week. The Lord instituted His uh, supper as a memorial feast in Matthew 26 and verses 26. Or, or, yes, in verses 26 through 29. I want to be there 
to commune with my Lord. I want to sing with my brothers and my sisters so that we might admonish and exhort and encourage one another. I want to be in the, the assembly where God's word is being preached, where we are praying to God, where we are encouraging and edifying one another. Yes, I think I must be involved in the worship and assembly of the saints if I want to go to heaven. Hebrews 10 says in verse verses 25, well, let's start in 24. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking our own assembling together as the custom of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. I want to go to heaven. I want to be in the assembly with the saved. It's our desire as brothers and sisters in Christ to go to heaven. God has established his body of saved people to come together to encourage, to exhort, to admonish, to lift up his name in our prayers and in our singing. I want to be with those of like precious faith. I need the time of exhortation. I need to be provoked and stirred up unto love and good works. How important it is that we assemble with God's people, that we assemble with the saints because we help and encourage one another on this road in life to go to heaven. I appreciate the question. I appreciate so much the good job Brother Brandstatter, Brother Simon, Brother Cowan done all this month. They've done a great job. We really appreciate their efforts. I appreciate this last question, the good answer that was given. You know, during the pandemic, a lot of people got out of the habit of worship, and they desperately need to get back in that habit. They need the fellowship of their brethren in Christ and the opportunity to worship together with people of like precious faith. If you've gotten out of the habit, I want to encourage you to get back in it today. Thanks so much for watching A Bible Answer. And remember, for your Bible questions, there's always a Bible answer. We would love to hear from you, our viewers. If you have questions for A Bible Answer, or if you'd like any of the material offered on this program, please contact us at the address on the screen. We appreciate all of our supporters, and we encourage you to worship with the faithful Church of Christ in your area.